The Book of Recollections, Episode 8, Ascending Chaos by Dysylvania. Have you ever wondered what makes a good story? Well, I have. And there's one thing that always gives me a thrill, not knowing what comes next. And here we are in the middle of a fight within the halls of the Midnight University. Who will win? Who will die? Who will survive? What then? Well, settle down and let's find out. The sound of clashing steel echoed through the halls of the Midnight University as Pax engaged his nemesis. Although badly wounded, the flames seemed to be able to keep up with the half-elves' attacks as the sound of their fight filled the surroundings. Enraged, the arch-nemesis went for a final assault, but Pax was ready, rushing towards his charge. That time, the sound of steel was replaced by a more visceral chime, and the two stopped moving. Passing on the other side of his opponent, the adrenaline filled the half-elf, making him question if the flame's frenzied attack hit him. But behind Pax, Flame announced his defeat as he began to cough blood. Down on his knees and on the brink of oblivion, the flame spoke. Yet his words were not directed at Pax. The various religious tattoos on the man turned red hot as he caught fire. The hallway echoed with the flame's ecstatic laughter, which quickly turned to screams of agony. Finally, the guards arrived. Understanding what was afoot, Pax tried to push through the flames and knock the man unconscious, but the heat was too much, burning his arm. To Pax's surprise, the fire on his rival took the form of radiant light, and, within it, he saw the silhouette of the flame elongating and convulsing, which harkened back to the memory of the individual who caught fire in the Cloud's commercial district. As Pax raised his shield, knowing that an explosion was about to occur, he addressed the raging fire, asking if the murderer was worthy to ascend, just as a bright light encompassed the hallway. Meanwhile, as this ordeal took place, Genevieve's hand trembled on Leo's scorched body. The pleading voice of the Dampier drew the attention of Grace, who, after making her way to the scene, explained why the ritual could not have worked and offered to help. The body had to be healed before Leo could be returned, and, in order to do so, an endu had to be used. As Grace finished the first half of the ritual, the burns on the man's body disappeared, leaving behind the handsome visage of Leo. Taking the Dampier's hand, the young girl prayed to Obscuro to allow the Chancellor's soul to return. A moment passed before Leo, taking a painful, deep breath, opened his eyes, just in time for them to see the light emanating from the university. The bright blaze imploded, and then a bolt of radiant light sprouted out towards the sky, and with it, a booming voice addressed the city, urging its believers to follow inside the Ring of Fire. Everywhere in Greenspring, people began to cheer at the words, as four individuals were consumed by flame and ascended. With the ecstatic screams turned to chaos and agony, as not all the followers ascended, being instead consumed by the ravenous flames. Pandemonium spread amongst the civilians. Leo looked around and saw Pax rushing towards them, stopping briefly to hear the guard's explanation about the chaos that was unfolding in the streets. Shaken but still composed, Pax ordered two of his men to take the Chancellor into custody, while the rest needed to bring order to the district. The streets of the Midnight District reverberated with the sound of explosions, as only a quarter of the followers of the flame ascended. You could see the guards apprehending the urnals at every corner, and, although that district praised Obscuro, many of the buildings had signboards questioning their allegiance. Along the way, Pax interacted with various guards, relaying the same message, to focus their efforts only on the violent individuals. However, his orders seemed to fall on deaf ears as the visibly exhausted guards yearned for revenge. As the group reached the Ancestral Light's place of worship, they were met by guards besieging the Luminite Church whilst making sure that no one was granted passage. 
Their attire was different from that of the usual defenders of Greenspring. They were the palace guardians. Amongst the ranks, Pax recognized Cassandra Hall, whose stern look pierced through the crowd. Approaching the general, Pax was chastised not only for allowing the flame to become a martyr, but also for not being around when chaos erupted. Although Pax tried to explain the events that took place that night, General Hall was adamant that the half-elf was instrumental in giving the flame the grounds to ascend, blaming him for rushing into battle without waiting for the platoon of 50 men to arrive. But was Pax sent 50 men? Well, more or less. I'm not a math book after all. But I do wonder who was in charge of dispatching the guards. Pax pointed out that, instead of shifting blame, the focus should be on allowing the High Priest of the Luminite Fate to disavow the actions taken by the Flame. General Hall told him that the Diurnals were kept inside the Deep Pit prison and, from the reports she received, they were fearful that something terrible was going to happen. Having a new objective in sight, our protagonists began to make their way back into the Midnight District. The cold fortress that doubled as a prison was a sight to behold. It was opulent and terrifying in equal measure. They made their way towards the cell which held one of the Luminite High Priests, among other prisoners, consisting mainly of diurnals, some of which had no involvement in what had happened. But, on their way, they met Leo. Pax went further down to meet with the High Priest Pergasus. But, before engaging the individual, Pax urged one of the guards to bring forth a pixie who went by the name of Priestess Lux, to bear witness to everything. During their discussion, Pax discovered that the flame was nothing more than a rank and, above all else, he was human, which was quite strange, especially seeing how he was able to ascend. The High Priest was shaken, but not due to Flame's actions, but those of Pax's men as they slaughtered many innocent followers of Lumino. Not even Pax's silver-coated tongue was enough to sway Bradassus, as the High Priest promised he would take his time to think about whether or not he would disavow the acts of the Ring of Fire. As the half-elf opened the door, allowing Bradassus to leave, the terrified guard told him that the Queen herself ordered for these people to remain locked up. That did not intimidate Pax, who simply told him that the Knight of Armistice found them innocent. As the High Priest left, the Pixie was ordered to go in front of the church and tell the people that the acts committed by the Flame had nothing to do with the High Priest and that the building would be reopened. Meanwhile, at Leo's cell, Genevieve engaged in a heartfelt conversation with her old friend as a whirlwind of emotions hit the dampier. Her mind raced with the images from earlier that night, from seeing her friend almost dying, to him being dragged away in chains. As Pax returned to the group, he began to question the Chancellor, who let out that he decided to play the role of a double agent, but his plans were foiled and led to his death. Convinced, the half-elf let the man go. Before heading to get some rest, Adam told the group that he would meet them the following day. At home, as soon as he entered the family mansion, he got into a heated conversation with his mother about his actions, his lack of care for his education, and getting involved with mere strangers. That night, Adam dreamt of a golden apple tree catching fire. Then, the image of the Sabbath water infected his dream. Members of his family were emerging from the water, all cloaked in shadows. Adam woke up, his last memory of the vision was his father urging him to act as the Book of Vim was burning. That night, at the Coq Gourmand, the group turned over for the night, but not before Jen took the time to engage in pleasantries with Leo, telling him that, when things died down, the two should cook together. Unbeknownst to anyone, Marthas appeared in Kate's room, offering her a night to remember, a night of passion equal to none but his advances were met by a wall of backhanded remarks and sass, which made the astral take a step back in amazement that someone was able to resist his influence. Before leaving, 
he reassured Kate that once she refused pleasure, only pain would await. The day of Martha's found Adam in the middle of his exams, and, although passing the theoretical appliances of transmutational arts with flying colors, the practical examination caused him many grievances. After failing his exam, the teacher acknowledged the ingenuity of Adam, but, for an individual destined to become the head of the hebdomatic order, that was not the right path. A bit ashamed of what had happened, he began to make his way towards the Coq Gourmand and, for the duration of the trip, all he could think of was that he had one last chance to pass it. The morning sun found Kate waking from her slumber and, much to her dismay, Martha's words came true. Her palm became a host to a parasitic mouth which spoke in her own voice, playing on her fears, doubts, and the dark thoughts that had plagued her mind ever since the tomb of time. Downstairs, Genevieve was in the middle of making breakfast for her friends, especially Leo, whom she wanted to amaze with her culinary skills. With the group back together, Adam included, Kate shared her predicament with them, amazing everyone, especially Grace and Pax. The two weren't surprised at the fact that Martha's bestowed that curse on their friend, but rather that Kate was able to counter the raw lust that emanated from him. Although no one in the group was able to cure Kate, Grace led them to a humble-looking building found in the Midnight District that went by the name of Clement's Tonic and Aromatics. Within the crammed shop, filled with all manners of trinkets and baubles, a man dressed in a leather jacket with pale skin and hair half black, half purple, welcomed them with a child standing by his side. Grace presented them as Castiel and Timmy, and the party understood from their talk that the girl had quite a debt owed to the man. Only after Genevieve offered to feed the proprietor of the establishment, Castiel agreed to check on Kate's ailment. Clement's room was upstairs, and, although filled with prejudices, his bad nature was tempered by the sublime food served by the dampier. Downstairs, however, the room Kate was brought to was extremely cramped and filled with rot and decay coming from old papers and who knows what else. Among the hideous display, Kate saw something that, at first glance, resembled a cat, but, upon closer inspection, had more limbs than a normal cat should. After begrudgingly cleaning the operating table, Cassiel studied Kate's hand mouth and realized that it was a curse with roots in some form of necromancy. Scalpel in hand, Castiel began the delicate operation which saw the mouth react, turning its snarky comments towards him. Because the harsh words uttered by the mouth were breaking his concentration, the man made the gesture in the air, leaving behind faint purple traces. Although the mouth continued its harsh remarks, it was as if the words fell on deaf ears, the operation was successful, leaving only a tiny red dot upon Kate's palm, which did not fully heal. As the three went back upstairs, the group seemed to have rubbed off against Castiel, making him feel more at ease around them. But the amazed look on Pax's face as he rushed into the shop, alongside Grace, put a momentary stopper to the discussion. Everyone, Castiel included, bolted in the direction of the Green Spring Palace. Whilst dashing through the streets, Pax told the group that he had just received a letter informing him that the declaration for the competitors in the Thrones and Thorns trials were commencing. Here's a fun fact from your favorite book of recollections. The Thrones and Thorns trials is how the next Maritrona gets elected in Greenspring. The contenders must prove their kinship, merit and leadership qualities. Not a bad way to choose your ruler, is it? Opulence of the royal domain was not taken in by the group as they barged into the royal hall. A man was in the middle of a countdown as another presented the competitors, three of which were the sons of the queen. All three had red hair. Pax jumped onto the podium where he introduced himself as Prince Evander before presenting his cohort, made up of the rest of the party. It took a moment for Castiel to realize that he was also a part of it. The countdown ended, but the forceful bang emanated from the closed entrance doors. 
Pax ordered the guards to allow the person in for everyone to see who was the individual that the queen had robbed of the chance to compete. As the doors opened once more, a woman with red hair introduced herself as Lena Blunder Gudrun, which caused the people present to whisper in amazement, calling her the Banished. Wait, Lena? Will be wishing well? Oh, now that's the kind of plot twist I live for! After she took the stage, followed by her cohort made of both wildlife and, to everyone's surprise, Monkey and Blaze, the Hebdomads appeared and Saturni made a waving gesture in the air. The trials had begun. This was the recap for episode 8 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I'm Ruxandra Vorotnep, your recap narrator. If you'd like to follow our Dungeons & Dragons campaign, Vim, the Tale of Immortality, tune in Sundays at 5 UTC on youtube.com slash New recaps drop every Friday evening. Thanks for sticking with us, and remember, every subscribe keeps the magic going. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampire bite!